Good afternoon and welcome to the 21st annual exhibit of Hydrogen and Fuel Cell Technologies. We discuss a broad range of technologies that allow us to operate energy cleaner uh, and of course with less dependency on foreign sources if it's possible. Uh, we use various fuels and we need fuel specialists and people who are involved in um, uh, working with energy in a very broad sense. Uh, today we'll be talking with Professor Gunther Kolb who's head of the Division of Energy Technology at Fraunhofer and we'll be talking about hydrogen generation from, you guessed it, alcohol fuels through internal and external reforming. Please welcome with me Professor Gunther Kolb. Hello. Hello. Before we, I mean, everyone knows Fraunhofer, anyone who has an MP3 player knows the, uh, the geniuses at work there, um, but uh, you work at a specific part of Fraunhofer. Could you describe exactly what you do uh, in your field? So we are working in the field of, of as, as far as hydrogen is concerned, we are working in the field of hydrogen generation from, from all kinds of fuels, alcohol fuels, but also natural gas or LPG, so fuel processing to make hydrogen for fuel cells, and then in a large uh, variety of other chemical reactions. This is, uh, we used to be purists here thinking that we create hydrogen from water uh, pure, but there's such abundant uh, resources available um, uh, um, and uh, we need to have the possibility, of course, to use other um, energy denser sources, alcohol, ethanol. Before we get to these uh, things, so um, we got into a conversation about this little device here, um, which has an interesting history behind it and perhaps a great future, considering what's happening in the automobile industry right now. Um, could you describe what this is? Yeah, this is a, a plate heat exchanger and it's coated with catalyst and through that coating it gets a chemical reactor. And if you look at chemical reactors as they were designed in the past by chemical industry, they were built to be operated after a few days of startup for many years without any interruption. So the problems we have to solve now in our distributed applications, automotive or uh, later on I will also tell, tell you what this reactor especially is for, for uh, aerospace applications, then we have completely different scenario. Yeah? So the reactors need to be operated at partial load, they will be started up and shut down maybe several times in an hour and that is not what a regular chemical reactor, what you call fixed bed, is made for. With these plate heat exchangers, we can integrate heat exchange functions, and by that we get a much better operability uh, of the reactors. Yeah? Uh, so you can avoid that they get too hot, for example, that the catalyst is damaged, and all these kind of things. So problems which are currently an issue in the automotive industry yeah, with the exhaust cleaning problems. Yeah, they also originate partially from such kind of problems of heat management of the reactors. As you all know, in your car, when you go on full acceleration, full speed, the, the exhaust gas treatment system is switched off. Why? Because it cannot handle all the heat which is generated then. Yeah? So these are reasons why it should be thought about using other reactor technology to improve the performance of such systems. This has led to an immense scandal, of course, because um, if you ensure that your vehicle is tested only when that device can deal with the exhaust, um, uh, but you factually know that uh, the reactor is not the one you've designed, um, uh, but uh, one that cannot deal with that. It's, it, it, it's, it's a monolith, yeah. <laughs> a ceramic monolith, it, it has no possibilities for heat management, uh, apart from putting heat exchangers upstream and downstream, which of course makes it more complicated. So have the automobile uh, uh, manufacturers contacted you? <laughs> It sounds like there's a huge market for that. We had some discussions already, yes. Let's hope so. Now, uh, um, I mentioned alcohol. Um, I have all sorts of private uses of alcohol I like. Why use alcohol? Of course, there's many forms of alcohol. We're talking about methanol, I assume, and ethanol. Um, uh, what is the great interest in alcohol as a source for hydrogen? So, every 
alcohol has its own advantages and disadvantages. Yeah? So we know that the second lar largest market for, for fuel cells, the largest number of systems sold worldwide, apart from the residential systems in Japan, which work with natural gas, are the methanol fuel systems, which are sold to, uh, by Bella to, to uh, India and, and Africa. And for, for the power supply of telecommunication systems, yeah, because people don't want to have interrupted communication. So these telecommunication systems are also powered by fuel cells to make sure that there is a stable uh, communication system existing. So for, for that purpose, methanol has advantages because the reforming, the transformation of the methanol to the hydrogen is operated at very low temperature. The disadvantage is the availability in these countries for methanol and of course it's also toxic. So ethanol on the other side has advantages because it's less or not toxic, depends on <laughs> how, you how much you drink. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, <coughs> And the availability in these countries will be higher. This is the reason why we, together with partners from, from Finland and Sweden and other country, European countries, are currently developing a system for such telecommunication uh, applications which is uh, applying methanol, uh, ethanol as fuel. Yeah? And then we have other applications which are very specific. Mm -hmm. I, I can explain uh, that now. So we have another system which is designed for airplanes, for passenger airplanes. So as you know, uh, or maybe you don't know, uh, the passenger area in the, in the airplane is several times exchanged. And from change to change, the power demand of these uh, the, uh, in the plane is increasing because there is more and more comfort equipment. Everybody wants to run his own equipment there. Yeah? So, and at the end, you end up with a situation where the power supply from the turbines is not sufficient anymore. So now the company Deal Aerospace uh, thought about that problem and they came to us and said, we should develop a system, a fuel cell system, which can make electricity out of a really non-toxic fuel, which is already, there is an allowance already to, to operate it in, in, in aerospace. Yeah? So and we found propylene glycol, uh, which is already used as de-icing uh, agent and as uh, coolant, yeah? uh, to be a very good fuel. You, you can even drink it, it's fat to pigs. Yeah? So it's, it's no problem, it's not toxic at all. But it's not very easy to, to, to do the reforming of that. Yeah? So we had some problems initially, but now it's running very well. So we have now a system which makes out of the propylene glycol with a fuel cell electricity, 5 kilowatt, peak power up to 15 kilowatt, buffered by the battery, which fits into a trolley. So as you know, there are several kitchens, several galleys in, in a plane. So A380, I think, has 12 or even more, so you have a power supply then by eight, uh, 12 such trolleys of 60, peak power up to 180 kilowatt, which is substantial. And then you also have something which is redundant and which can work also as an emergency system because there are many trolleys there. If one fails, the others still are working. So you have a redundant power supply grid. So this is the concept we are working at. And, and there, the price of the propylene glycol is not such an issue. Yeah? We, of course, you would say it's too expensive to make electricity out of it, but in this specific case, because you want to put it in the passenger area, it's a very good fuel. Yeah? And it's a lot less <coughs> expensive than uh, designing the turbines again uh, of course. to create more energy. Yeah, yeah. of course. Uh, so this is a specific application. It's something, it's a technology that you could operate indoor. Mm -hmm. Basically, yes. okay, because that raises the environmental issue. Whenever we use um, uh, uh, methanol, ethanol, it still produces CO2. Yes, it There's does. still okay, but it's uh, the question of the quantity, uh, I suppose. Um, uh, it, the the indoor operation is something that fascinates me because um, it's it's so vital in that context. Um, other reforming technologies. 
um, using conventional fossil fuels or ethanol methods, they all are, it's not the purest uh, um, renewable energy electricity coming from a turbine going into a PEM cell, but they still are highly efficient and uh, better than burning the fuel itself. Uh, of course, the efficiency of a fuel cell is always higher than compared to a combustion engine. This is clear. You can reach much higher efficiencies. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So, but, uh, mm. many of the issues of efficiency that they're, uh, they're they're not always primarily important. But um, to get back to the fuel issue, we've mentioned alcohol uh, in two forms: ethanol, methanol. Uh, you're also in. Involved in the research and development of biodiesel fuel. Yes, uh, we also work on a, on a let's say, converting uh, not uh, edible oils such as used cooking oil or uh, vegetable oils from other sources which are not competing with the food, let's say, food supply system. Eh? by using a supercritical method, so process intensification to get smaller reactors and to convert uh, also such kind of uh, not easy to convert sources into, into biodiesel. Yeah? So this is something, there's a, there's a huge market for used cooking oil in, in Germany. It's something like several hundred thousand tons of used cooking oil mm -hmm. coming up, which you normally would just dispose of or burn, so you can make biodiesel out of that. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So this is something we're also working at. Uh, and uh, other areas are, for example, making synthetic gasoline out of wood residues. There's a lot of wood residue in Germany now. So topics like that we're also working at. Uh. And bio-waste? Mm, not at all currently. No. Not at all? Solid, solid uh, apart from these wood residues, this is some sort of bio-waste. Yeah, it's lying around in the forest. And, uh, okay. Um, uh, one has to think of the energy market, of course, as highly diverse. Uh, certain applications are vital to certain countries. We have a stable grid here. Um, uh, the market for utility power has a different structure. Where are areas where you see um, good opportunities for business models using uh, reforming of um, methanol or ethanol for utility power, for example? Do you have any uh, market in, in, in mind when you think, for instance, the Asian market, the African market, or is it the European market? So, let's say for, for backup power systems, as I said, in, in India and, and Africa, this is currently the market for, for selling such systems, yes? Mm -hmm. Okay, and you're using basically fuels. Are they readily available in those regions? Um, Diesel ethanol is easiest available in, in, in these areas. Yeah? Mm -hmm. You can make it most easiest way by fermentation. Yeah? Okay. And, and we also try to, to use bioethanol, yeah? mm -hmm. which doesn't need to be so pure. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's really available in these areas. Yeah? Mm -hmm. I should add that if there's uh, questions from the audience, please feel free to raise your hand and we'll do our best to address them. Uh, uh, yesterday when we were preparing, we got on the topic of methanization, uh, and I always like to describe what exactly we're talking about, because it's not really a common term in English. Um, it is uh, uh, from hydrogen that is created from renewable resources through electrolysis, you have a pure source of hydrogen, uh, and the question is, where do you go with that hydrogen? There's such an excessive amount, not excessive, there's a positive amount of renewable energy. The wind turbines in the north of Germany are a great source of energy, um, but it's a question of what do we do after electrolysis with this quantity of hydrogen, which could only increase. They're turning the turbines off right now. Um, that is slowing the development of that resource, wind energy. Um, so uh, there is a running debate about what we should do. Uh, methanization or not, do we add CO2 from what source to create a methane type gas? What is your take on this? Um, so there are different CO2 sources. As we know, it can be a biogas plant. It can also be a steel factory, which has a huge amount of CO2 available. And it could be used, of course, and I think it's, it's reasonable to make with the hydrogen together with the hydrogen methane 
which is actually pure natural gas out of it. Yeah? That, that is very obvious. And then we have no limitations anymore to feed it into the natural gas grid, and this is a huge uh, energy storage buffer. Yeah? So in, in terawatt uh, range. Yeah? So I think it's a very good idea. And then, of course, such plants, what I told before about the reactors, they need to be operated dynamically depending on the on the wind available, yeah. So and and on the on the power demand, actual power demand in the grid, yeah. And therefore, we are also working together with partners on developing such uh, methanation or methanization reactors, uh, which can be cooled. To get better dynamic behavior and avoid overheating of the reactors and get a better performance of the overall plant. Yeah? Since we are talking about such a large quantity of energy, is it foreseeable that methanization can be scaled up to that level? We are talking about huge amounts, potentially huge amounts of hydrogen that we have to deal with. Um, is it? Is it feasible to scale that up? Are there, is, can it be mass manufactured, the technology, once it's... Um... As feasible as look out, uh, more or less out of the windows or see how many windmills are already operated now. So it's, I think it's not an issue to put also such plant. It's just a question of political will, maybe. <laughs> it needs an initial investment, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, and. Uh, just to clarify the issue here, uh, why not stick 100% to the uh, hydrogen? How much hydrogen can the natural gas grid absorb? Um, at what point do we need methanization? Or can we forget about methanization until the problem occurs? How much, natural, how much hydrogen can we put into the natural gas grid? So, it, yeah, so the numbers available vary a lot, and also from country to country. So you can hear numbers between 5 and maybe 12 percent, but there are some limitations, this is clear. Yeah? At some point the flame propagation properties of the gas will change too much that you cannot run your equipment downstream anymore, yeah? that, that is clear. Yeah? That is the, the characteristics of the way it burns changes such that you have to install a new stove. Mm. Okay, very interesting. This is, um, it's, uh, of course, possible to get into such fine detail, and you're actually a specialist in the field, so much of this discussion really has to take place at the stand. Um, Professor Gunter Kolb's stand is right behind us, it's B72, um, uh, and certainly one of the most knowledgeable um, uh, persons I've ever talked to on the issues of gases, on the issues of using energy efficiently, um, and with such a broad range of expertise. It's always a pleasure to talk to you, we hope you come back next year um, uh, with uh, more, more innovation and more technologies. Pleasure to see you again. Thank you. Thank you. I was just talking to uh, uh, Professor Gunter Kolb, head of the Division of Energy Technology at Fraunhofer. The booth is right around the corner here. It is B72. Uh, join him there um, and continue the conversation about hydrogen generation from alcohol fuels through internal and external reforming. Up next on stage, we'll be talking to Phil Dorn, Managing Director of ITM Power. Yay! And uh, they'll be talking about power to gas, a very related topic, and gas storage in Germany. So stay tuned. Thank you.